You're listening to Dish It Up, a monthly podcast serving up the latest news, trends, and events relating to the San Diego food scene. This podcast is recorded as a collaboration between Pacific Magazine and Eating and Drinking San Diego at the Specialty Produce Studios. This is Edwin Rial. I am with uh, my guest today. His name is Danilo DJ Tangalin. He's a Filipino like me, and he is opening up a new restaurant over in North Park. It's called Bivouac Cider Works. DJ. How you doing? How are you? Doing great. Already had a full day today. Stopped yeah. by a few friends, uh, said hi, ate around town, so that was fun. You doing research uh, around town, or are you just uh, eating your way through because you don't uh, really have a restaurant until, what, a couple of weeks? Pretty soon, pretty soon. According to our schedule that you know we've been working on the last couple of weeks, we should have at least some type of soft opening or mock service by November 12th. November 12th, yeah. right in time for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Tell me, um, how did you get into food? I uh, probably had no choice because I was born into the food industry. My mom, um, when she was growing up, um, her family owned a bunch of uh, fish farms in Iloilo in the Philippines. That's a little bit like south, but not too south. So it's in like Visayan region. Um, and then when she moved to the city where my dad grew up, she opened a little cantina where I helped her kind of run the business. And she was also involved in the, uh, we call it wet market so there's like the dry market, which is a lot of grocery. Wet market is where you get like fresh fish, fresh meat. And so my mom had a stall there. So I helped her to learn how to butcher fish very early. And on top of that, we were doing our own lunch delivery service. And uh, when did you immigrate to America and where did you settle first? Yeah, so my dad actually moved to the States first back in 97. And we followed as soon as he got the right paperwork to kind of get us here. And so we stayed in Hawaii for three years in the island of Oahu. Uh, we stayed in Aiea, Eva Beach, and Hawaii Kai, and then spent three years there, and then we moved to New Jersey. So Hawaii to New Jersey, different car. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah, and then uh, so my p- family kind of settled in Jersey. I uh, ended up going to culinary school in Jersey and then traveled after that. Where did you travel to a little bit everywhere. So I worked in Jersey, uh, a restaurant called Jay's on 3rd. It's a small little restaurant, 60-seater, but really, really good food. Um, the chef that I work with, which I consider my first mentor, his name is Jason Hippen. He worked under Morimoto, um, William Bradley at Addison, uh, Stodge at Marea in New York, two Michelin star. Um, after working for him, I started as a line cook, kind of climbed the ladder, ended up being his chef de cuisine. And after four years, you know, it was... Me and him decided it was time for me to learn new things and learn under different chefs. So I moved to Philadelphia because that was the closest big city in where I lived in Jersey, in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, ended up, you know, luckily ended up at the Ritz Carlton to work for an Eric Repair concept restaurant called Ten Arts. And I worked under a uh, chef named Jennifer Carroll, who was in Top Chef. What style of cuisine do you prefer? Uh, For me, like, you know, from traveling across the country, learning from different chefs, you know, what I learned is kind of putting everything together. You know, my roots is Filipino, but, you know, my chef, my first chef was Thai and we were both classically French trained and, you know, gathering different techniques, you know, learning here in San Diego about Mexican cuisine. And, you know, when I was up north in San Francisco, learned some more really refined cuisine. Um, So I would say it's just a combination of everything. It's all about seasonality and partnering it with classic techniques and doing modern platings. Do you believe that Filipino cuisine is the next big thing? I think the next big thing is what everybody's dubbing it, but I felt like Filipino cuisine has always been there. It just needed to be in the spotlight a little bit more. But once, you know, Anthony Bourdain talks about it, April Bloomfield talks about it, Andrew Zimmerman talks about it, you know, now that the last year or so everyone's talking about it, you know, Philippine cuisine has always been there. It's been there for hundreds of years. It's just, it's on the spotlight now. So it's up to us chefs that, you know, really embrace the cuisine to, you know, kind of keep pushing it forward. So Japanese cuisine had their thing in the 70s and 80s. Thai, Korean had it in the 90s and 2000s. What's going to push Filipino cuisine forward in your eyes? I think it's consistency. You know, um, I just, um, 
went to a dinner hosted by Anthony Sensei at J6, and he partnered up with three chefs that was a recipient of Chef Celebration. And it's this young chefs, you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of up-and-coming Filipino chefs, and there's chefs like me and Anthony and Evan and Christiani and Craig Jimenez that's been always been pushing it a little bit at a time. When I had a chance to run a full menu, Filipino influence, a title, you know, felt like people really embraced it, and I was serving two to 300 people every night, Filipino food, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. So I think it's consistency and the way you present it. You know, a lot of people, I've seen a lot of Filipino chefs that kind of failed a little bit of doing Filipino food because they went 100% all in. You know, when they build their menu, they write it in Tagalog, and then they didn't really describe what it is. And it was kind of turned off on a lot of people. And I kind of learned from that and presented it in a way where it's palatable and it's easy to read. I think that's one of the key is like when you write a menu that's like a foreign, you know, cuisine, you have to make sure that people understand what it is and know where it's coming from. And when you talk about presentation, how how do you present Filipino food? Because a lot of times we know, being mm -hmm. Filipino, we go to Filipino restaurants that are traditional. It's all these turu turu joints mm -hmm. that are just steam table, cafeteria style, point point is what they call it. Yep. So how do we take that leap from being a turu turu joint to being acceptable in the mainstream? Well, I think, you know, people eat with their eyes, you know, and what I learned, you know, when I worked all over the country, it's it's about finesse. You know, it's just a little bit of finesse. You know, I don't really focus too much on presentation, like presentation is the last thing on my mind when I'm building a new dish. But when I finally conceptualize a dish, all the flavors work together. It's seasonal, it's sustainable. And then you think about presentation. Like I said, people eat with their eyes. And, you know, there's a lot of modern technique out there. You know, I don't really focus on that too much, but it's just finesse. You know, it, it looks good, it smells good, and people can appreciate it as soon as it hits the table. It makes them want it more. Does that elevation of presentation, will that eventually alienate our people? I don't think so. I mean, as long as it comes from the heart, you know, that's what I learned from putting together a couple of Filipino dinners already. Um, they support it. You know, there's a lot of old school people that really doesn't care about the presentation. But if you have a story behind it and you know where it's coming from the heart and, you know, you tell them about how you learn how to cook, you learn from your grandma or your mother and... People will respect that. People will respect that it's coming from a good place. And it it just depends. You know, if, if some people don't accept it, then we'll be stuck. You know, that's why I think presentation is somewhat important, but it's not really the main thing that will push Filipino cuisine. It's all about still being consistent about it and pre presenting it in a more education kind of way. When you were having these Filipino dishes at title, what did people gravitate to? Uh, people gravitate to what they think is familiar. So, for example, there's a Filipino dish called kare kare, which is a braised oxtail stewed in peanut sauce with, you know, bok choy and eggplant and Chinese long beans. And instead of oxtail, because people might be like, I've never really had oxtail. I'm kind of intimidated by it. So I just substitute the protein to short ribs, Perfect. you know, and... You know, that's not a big leap, but it's still short ribs, kare kare. And people are like, okay, I know what short ribs is, and I'm going to give it a try because it's short ribs, you know. Um, there's another dish that I did, um, bulalo. You know, bulalo is a, um, it's like a soup. Uh, it's a broth made out of bone marrow, you know. And people, you know, even still, even Americans or even expert diners are still somewhat intimidated by um, bone marrow. So I presented it in a way where, People recognize it as comfort food, so I did a style of um, bulalo um, French onion soup. Nice. Yeah. So I took the idea of a bulalo, introduced it, presented it in a French onion soup way, and people gravitate towards that. So if they can recognize it, play around with it, modernize old Filipino techniques, I think that's what you know will people will gravitate to. Do your relatives eat at your restaurant and order those things, or do they go traditional and eat something off uh, the regular menu? Um, I mean, I don't have relatives here in San Diego. It's just, I, we moved here because my wife's brother used to live here. Um, then he was in the Navy. Um, so my wife's family is on this side, but my family is in the East Coast. But every time there's Filipinos that come over, you know, when I was a title, it would always be their favorites. Um, you know, I have a version of adobo. I had a version of sinigang. And, you know, they would, they would order it. 
you know, their their main complaint is why doesn't everything come with the rice? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I'll explain it's like I can't serve everything with the rice, you know. And that's that's the funny part. But they 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 love it, you know, because it's modern people. You know, when you say sinigang, you know, it could be the pork ribs, and some people do, you know, with the milk fish, which is Philippine national fish. Um, but I do it with local f- seafood. You know, we had mussels, clams, you know, Mexican white shrimp, you know, and stuff like that. When you introduce a Filipino dish, why do you select certain dishes? What? Why do you? You know, you've said some classics, but mm-hmm. also like, what makes you think that? Okay, I'm going to create this dish. I'm going to put it on the menu, and we're going to hope it sells. But why did you select the dishes you did? Uh, for me, it always starts with you know when I'm building a dish, it always starts with what's in season. You know, after you come with seasonality, what flavors would go with this one? Um, after the flavor combination, then you think about technique. So, for example, there was a dish um, that's like when it was created, it was built from like leftover fish. You know, what they did is if you have a leftover fish at nighttime. In the morning, you cook some scrambled eggs, you put some broth, put some vegetables, and you pour it over the fish. You know, and I did a play on that because I have a little bit of Italian background, and I turned it into a pasta dish. You know, so I start with an idea, and then what's seasonal, and then what flavors go with it, and then techniques, and then the presentation would be last. Speaking of seasonal, your um, new restaurant is going to be seasonal. You're calling it in the moment food? Yeah. I like that over something called farm to table because, um, in my opinion, farm to table is kind of played out. Yeah. Because anyone can be, you know, anybody can be farm to table, but in the moment takes a chef driven concept and explores it even further locally and also seasonally. Talk about talk to us about that. Yeah. So I mean, people always dis- you know ask me what kind of food I cook, and I said in the moment, you know, and people are like, what does that mean? You know, it's just. What's in the moment? You know, I don't just say seasonal or farm to table. You know, for example, what we're doing at Bivouac Cider Works, it's one of the first and unique cider t- tap room in San Diego. And I'll be working very closely with our cider makers, you know, and for them, you know, exploring different flavor combination, seasonality, you know, we know it's apple based, but the flavors that will go with apples, you know, it could be anything. You know, we have hop cider coming up. We have pineapple and black Hawaiian sea salt coming up. And so I have to build my dishes according to what they're building. You know, we're, we're building a brand. You know, Bivouac is a brand. It's a cider tap house with a full restaurant service. And, you know, what we're doing is very unique. So in able to be consistent with what we're trying to send, you know, our message, which is, you know, cider that we're doing are very unique and very seasonal. That's the food has to match with that. Where is it in North Park? Uh, it's 30th and Lincoln. It's um, geographically the l- landmarks that you'll notice like around us are Coin Ops, Tornado, um, Streetcar, and we're across the street from Crazy Burger. Nice. That's right in the heart. It's prime, prime yep. location. How are people going to accept the first cidery in North Park? So I think it has to do with a lot of education, you know. Um, you know, when... My owners and our cider makers first came up with the idea of putting a cider tap room. You know, they at first they explored doing a brewery, and there's already a ton of brewery. You know, and you know one of our owners, you know, spent some time in Europe, and 25 percent of alcohol sales in Europe are cider, and in the U.S. it's one percent. So that's a market that no one dares to go or hasn't really explored it until you have the right people to put it together. You know, and one of our owners has been home brewing since he was a teenager, you know, and he worked closely with, you know, Mike Hess and learned from him. Um, and then we have another cider maker who spent about 12 years in the wine business. So cider is somewhere in between making wine and brewing beer and educating people on the history of cider. There's a lot of styles of cider. There's Scandinavian style cider. There's Spanish style cidre. There's the English style, which is a little more drier. And, you know, we're doing from sweet to dry to bubbly to barrel age. We're doing a lot of special releases. So we've been training the last couple of weeks about educating our staff. And our staff has been really, really good about taking in the knowledge of cider because that's first thing that people are going to ask, you know, how do you make cider? I had a guy who installed our soap. He was like, what's cider? <laughs> so even here, you know, 1% sale, you know, like in the beverage liquor department in our country, you know, 1%, it's, you, you know, it's an untapped market. And we're, 
taking this chance to, you know, put cider on the map. What's going to differentiate your place from places like um, Newtopia Cider, Julian Hard Cider? You know, there's a few now in San Diego. What's mm-hmm. going to make you guys different? I think it's just a combination of everything. You know, a lot of people, all those cider places you open, you, you mentioned, you know, they, I think ours with our techniques and our facility, I think our tap house is going to look outstanding. You know, it's built by um, Cultivate and Texture. It, it has so many little things that every time you turn around, you're like, ooh, that's something new. Ooh, that's something new. So, um, you know, it's just the flavors, you know, the brains behind, you know, our cider makers, you know, the food, um, the decor. But, you know, we focus a lot the last couple of weeks on service. You know, it, it is a, you know, it's tavern style, you know, tap room, you know, um, but service, you know, it's going to elevate it. For me, it's, it comes down to three things, ambiance, service, and then food and beverage, you know? So I think our ambiance is going to look great. Um, our service is going to top notch and we're going to work really hard to make sure our cider and our food, you know, delivers. That's uh, Marco Pierre White right there. For there you me. go. Um, let's talk about North Park. Why did they decide on North Park? Well, you know, when they were getting into the project and looking at different locations, I think it just made sense. Um, I know that there was one location that's not in North Park that they would have been able to uh, build a cider type room, but it wouldn't fit on like the food that they were trying to think. You know, they want to captivate an audience that just not going to go to cider. Because it's really hard, you know, when you say only 1% of our, you know, market drinks cider, it's hard to like just get them into the tap room. There's There has to be something that will attract them besides the cider and which is the food, you know. So when they were looking at location, they found they were looking at location where they can build a restaurant and people will embrace the restaurant and the cider at the same time and it'll attract more audience than they would hope so. Who's your cider maker? Um, his name is Matt Austin uh, and Preston and then our other owner is Lara Worm. I'm guessing you have spent recently a lot of time in North Park. Yeah, I mean, I've been hanging out there. Um, I think North Park was is one of my last, well, not last, but the only part of town that I haven't really cooked at. I mean, you know, I moved to San Diego about six years ago, spent a lot of time cooking very close to um, the beach and oceanfront views um, and never really cooked in like North Park, South Park, kind of Hillcrest area. So this is my first time cooking there. And I felt like my food, you know, will be accepted and people are going to be enjoying it. Where have you eaten in North Park? Ooh, North Park. Um, I haven't tried, well... Madison is one of the places that I want to try. I've done uh, One Door North. I did Underbelly. There's a couple more. I mean, I've been to Cardamom. I'm trying to think what else on top of my mind. But there's a lot of places that I want to visit. And I definitely want to check out Madison and what they're doing. I felt like they're kind of not too similar, but with the same concept of what we're doing. When you got to San Diego, you said you worked at the beach. I'm guessing it was Pacific Beach, right? Yeah, Pacific Beach. And um, I spent my first Three years in San Diego working for Whisk and Ladle Hospitality. So I was at Whisk and Ladle for a year and a half. And then um, they moved me to uh, Prep Kitchen Little Italy. Oh, I love Prep Kitchen. Yeah. Then what was your next gig after that? Uh, Jordan. Okay. Tell us about Jordan. Jordan was awesome, man. I mean, that was my first executive chef job. So it was definitely the one that I felt like turned my career around here in San Diego. Uh, Whisk and Ladle was a great, great company. I love them till now. I mean, Chef Ryan Johnston, I consider him my second mentor. He taught me so much about, you know, food and, you know, really respecting classic dishes. And, you know, like one of the biggest things that I learned from that company was what you put in the pot is what you get out of the pot. And I took everything I learned there. And and I started at Jordan. I started as a Sioux and ended up being an executive chef. And it's a great concept. They're actually going through a renovation right now. And, you know, at Jordan, I get to control a big staff, you know, the biggest staff I've ever had to manage, which is about close to between 30 to 40 cooks, which is a lot, you know, having that staff and, you know, the business volume that we were doing, breakfast, lunch, dinner, banquet, room service. So it was a lot of combination of like everything I learned from the Ritz Carlton to Whisk and Ladle from Jason Third, kind of put it together and use that to be able to run a big restaurant like Jordan. And then from Jordan, you went over to Decoy in San Marcos, Lake San Yeah, it was, um, it was the same company. Same owners. Right? So I was the exec chef of Jordan and then um, became the corporate chef. And Decoy was one of my projects to open. What happened there? 
Well, Decoy, you know, it was a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, the concept just didn't work. You know, it's, it's, we're trying to attract people from San Diego to go up in San Marcos. And it's just, like you said, like Filipino cuisine, it was just timing. It wasn't time for that concept to work up north. You know, maybe in a year or so, maybe two or three more years, you know, maybe San Marcos will be able to catch up. I mean, Oceanside is the hottest, you know, food scene right now. Like they're ready for whatever you throw at them, you know. Um, San Marcos is just not ready for it. From Decoy, you went over to um, Tidal. Tidal, yeah. Tell us about that time. Yeah, so Amy DiBiazzi, um, you know, one of the great chefs in San Diego, um, hit me up and said that, you know, she was moving on and she wanted me to apply for that position, and I did. Uh, met with the GM and, you know, did a tasting for them. It was, it's such a unique property. You know, it's been there for like 50 years 50 plus years, some of the workers there have been there since they were like 16 years old. Um, and the theme for me, like it's the location, you know, like by the water, palm trees everywhere. And the first thing that like really like came to my mind was like Filipino cuisine. You know, it's the location, the ambiance. And I think that's one of the reasons why what I did there worked. You know, as soon as I got there and people start hearing about like what we were doing. And like I said, we were feeding two, 300 people every night and eating Filipino food. And it was such a great platform for me to kind of get out of my shell of doing everybody else's food. Then I started doing my style of food, which is modern Filipino. So two of your last three jobs were at resorts yeah. or hotels. Mm -hmm. What makes that different from working at a standalone or, you know, a single location um, restaurant? So many things. I mean, at Tidal, we had a purchasing director. So everything we have to purchase has to go through the purchasing director. You know, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. You know, when you're trying to buy fresh from the market and you have to get out of the resort and, you know, buy stuff, paying cash to the farmers because, you know, they don't really have, some of them have receipts, some of them just write it on a piece of paper. You know, those are the things that are not really, not efficient, but not protocol for like resort areas. So that was kind of hard. And some of the things that, you know, they want you to do, like mandating you to buy from certain um, companies, you know, like you have to buy at least 80, 90 percent of your products from the place that they want you to buy from, you know, and sometimes that hinders creativity. Sometimes you just have to compromise on what they want, but compromising your integrity and, you know, not knowing where your food's coming from. But I mean, you take everything you you learn from it and. You know, with big resorts like that, you know, sometimes you don't even know who the real owners are because there's just so many. You know, it's like combining hotels with other properties and stuff like that. Um, but Jordan was awesome. You know, I knew the owner. I knew the VP. Uh, and, you know, from standalone, like Whisk and Ladle, you know, knowing the owners, that they go there for lunch, you know, going to their Halloween party at their house. Like, those are the differences. It's more like a family. And it's, you know, when you know who you're working for, that makes it a lot different. When you decided to go back to a standalone owner mm -hmm. establishment joint, what um, what made you decide to go back to that? Yeah, I mean, when I left Title, there was definitely a lot of options. You know, you know, you know that resorts pay well, pay better than most standalones because they have the resources, and you know that you can get certain items, certain equipment you know, um, certain exposure um, from bigger places because they have, you know, bigger PR firms and stuff like that. But when you, when you go down, you know, like when I decided to work with Bivouac, it was almost going back to my first restaurants in Jersey where it was the owner was the chef, the the GM was the, the wife, you know what I mean? So working with family-owned business and, you know, I talked to them and heard everything they said, it, you know, listen closely to what their vision is. And that's for me, like, that's the biggest thing. You know, I believed in the vision, you know, starting something from scratch. And this is my owner's first venture, you know, to be part of that, I think is, is special. You know, we all want to be, to belong to someone's, you know, be part of something special. And I think that's what attracted me the most. You know, it wasn't even, you know, we never discussed like, can I do Filipino food? You know, that wasn't really the discussion. The discussion is, can you make good food and people are going to love it? You know, and, you know, we were like, okay. That's what we're going to do, you know. You've been in San Diego for six years now? Yes. What do you love about San Diego? Uh, I mean, I like 
the fact that I believe that, you know, I'm part of a bigger thing, which is pushing the culinary scene forward in San Diego. You know, I think when I was doing my travels, I only meant to stay in San Diego for one year. And then life happens. You know, when I was at Whisk and Ladle, after a year at Whisk and Ladle, um, I was ready to move on and go back. It wasn't about the company. It wasn't about San Diego. I was just ready to move on to the next city. I was going to go to Austin next. And after that, I was going to go to New Orleans. And I had it all mapped up. I was going to go to um, Charleston after that and then finally go back to, like, Jersey with with the family. And, you know, I was a Sioux at Whisk. And after a year and a half, they were like, we want to make you the chef de cuisine. And I was like, wow, I can't really turn that opportunity down. And after Prep Kitchen Little Italy, I had my first daughter. Um, and it was kind of harder to move with you know, my daughter being born. And after that, I became an exec chef at Jordan. And, you know, that's an opportunity that I couldn't pass. And next thing you know, I have my son. <laughs> I had two kids. And, you know, besides besides the weather, you know, it's it's the community. You know, I've, I've made a lot of friends, met a lot of people. And knowing where everyone's focus is on the direction of the food industry in San Diego is, it's an awesome feeling to be a part of, you know, to be mentioned with, you know, Davin or, you know, other great chefs of like David pushing, Wright. Yeah. You know, of like pushing culinary, you know, and that's great because a lot of people look at San Diego as a, you know, second class food city. Of course. You know, and that's our job as chefs. You know, it's nobody else's job to push our cuisine altogether, not just Filipino cuisine, but like San Diego because it almost doesn't have a true identity when it comes to food, you know. How do you change that? Like I said, being consistent and always pushing it forward. You know, there's, not, I'm not talking about like making everything molecular gastronomy. You know, I'm talking about like consistency, the sustainability, staying current with food trends. And it's not all about giving people what they want. It's a give and take. You know, if if all the chefs cook what people want, we'll have 10,000 taco joints. That's what people want in San Diego. <laughs> and? You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with it, but it wouldn't get us to the point of like Chicago or San Francisco or LA or New York or Seattle or Portland or Austin or Pittsburgh. You know, it's it's compromised. And I think diners, you know, look at the 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 rise of pop-ups in San Diego. You know, it's it's working. Some people don't even have restaurants anymore. They just run pop-ups. What but, are your favorite pop-ups in town? I like what, you know, um, Steve Brown was doing the cosecha. I think he's, what he's doing is new to San Diego. And that guy is just a nonstop machine. You know, he knows what he wants. And he's not stopping until he, he gets it, you know, and... Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But at least he believes in what he was trying to do and he's staying behind what he's doing, which is the Wagyu, Satsuma, you know. Um, never been to Cowboy Bear, but I mean, I think, I don't really know the concept, but I know it's Cowboy Bear. But I've heard that there's like different chefs who's doing it, never really been part of it. But, you know, that's something that someday I want to try whoever's food it is. <laughs> Have you ever been? I've never been, but yeah. I... Have you heard like I, I what know, they do? I believe I know who it is. Yeah. There's a group of them. So yeah. I, I believe I know who it is. Yeah. Um, but we won't say that right now. Yeah. Yeah. They, somebody told me it's like, it's not just one person. They pass it along to whoever's next and available. Whoever's and, off. Yeah. Whoever's off. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. You mentioned Steve Brown. We um, went to the friends and family when they opened up uh, mm-hmm. Temp. Yeah. And my buddy who I went with, he said, oh, this is probably the best French bistro, and they don't even try to be a French bistro. Yeah. You know, they're not saying they're a French bistro. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Steve Brown's got a reputation around town of being a good chef, and I didn't want to believe the hype. And, man, I tried his food, and it was delectable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he trained, you know, under a lot of people, and he's he's self-taught. And like I said, you know, he, he believed in techniques. You know, I think his food, we've done a few dinners together, and— he believes in techniques, you know, he believes in seasonality, you know, getting, you know, the best product available. You know, when I worked at, um, I did a stage at La Bernadine and you can see it's like different cuisines, different techniques, different, the fish is from all over the world. But his philosophy is like, if you get the best products and do the best technique for it, then it'll always work. There's nothing really magic behind it. You know, you get the best fish, cook it the best way possible. It's going to turn out to be a great dish. You know, what do you like to cook with in San Diego? What are your some of your favorite ingredients? Your favorite proteins? What do you what do you what do you like cooking with in San Diego? Coming I've out always, of the county, I've always been a fish guy. So, 
any fish that comes out of tuna dock side or, you know, I work a lot with Pacific shellfish. Their, their standards are really, really high when it comes to picking good products. Um, I do fish a lot. So um, just quick pan seared fish or if it's a nice buttery fish, I steam it, pair it up with any seasonal vegetables there is. If it grows together, it'll probably taste good together. You know, if it's, it's butternut squash, you know, you pair it with some fall mushrooms and pomegranate put some cheese it's it's gonna be good you know so seasonality that's one thing and you know things that grow together it will always taste together so even when you look at some of the dishes that are the fish's diet you know if the fish eats crab you know and you pair it with some type of crab and put a technique behind it like do it like a crab soup with like a f- seared fish dish it's probably gonna taste good together it's friday night and we're off service yeah service has ended we're ready to go out. Where do we go eat? I do a lot of convoy. I do a lot of convoy. Min Sok Chon, Tajima, Soho. So I do a lot. Of, I eat a lot of ramen. Way too much that my wife's like, every time I want to go out, she's like, as long as it's not ramen, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the other part of that is um, a lot of those joints are open late for yeah. restaurant mm-hmm. uh, employees yeah. and service industry employees. So They we, know the secret. Yeah. They're but, like, We'll open until three. Yeah, exactly. They're like, that's like two, three grand. That's like, you know, market. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's at least a handful of cooks that wants to eat at night and they capture that audience. You know, it's about thinking about like, who's your audience and who can come in your restaurant at that late at night. Where are we eating brunch tomorrow? Brunch tomorrow. I usually go to like anywhere that has like a view, you know? So anywhere like somewhere like, I go to like Pacific Beach or Mission Beach. I ate at Catamaran. Uh, the other day for the first time, and I was like, "That's a that's a great place to eat because he has just the view, people running, and you're just like eating down your egg Benedict, and you get just girls running bikinis." I'm like, "That's money." <laughs> that's San Diego. For that's you. San Diego. You know, people care about taco party and fitness <laughs> in San Diego. Fitting this whole taco in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of Mexican food, let's. Let's talk about your introduction to Mexican food. What do you what do you eat locally? What as as far as Mexican food is concerned? So for the first five years I was in San Diego, I didn't have my passport. I've been eligible to get a passport forever, and the only reason why I got my passport because um, a group of chefs and industry people were planning to eat at Noma in Tulum, Mexico, yeah. and I was like, I gotta go be a part of this, and so I got my passport and I was able to go. And ever since then, I've been to I've been going to TJ a lot and just eating there. I was at Oryx for um, Chef Rupo Ibarra's restaurant. That was very very impressive for like what they're doing over there. And I've been to Valle, check out a few uh, wineries that I can't think of the name because some of them I can't even pronounce. Um, went to Ensenada. Yeah, and people are like giving me proper tours on TJ the last you know few months. But in here, I don't think. I have like a solid favorite. I did the, um, somebody put up the uh, top 10 best taco places. And I tr- me and um, when we were doing R&D with the GM of Jordan, we did like the top five out of the top 10. And there's one that's really good. Um, it's like, it's in by Chula Vista. It was a food truck. I forgot what the name is, but they're- Galito? I don't know. Is it a torta truck? No, it's not a torta truck. It's like a taco. Mm. Yeah. But that was really good. And then I w- we went to Oscars by um, Bird Rock area. Yeah. That was good. That's the best 99 cents I'll spend. Mm-hmm. It's a fried fish taco for 99 cents. That was really good. And there was a couple more that we, because we were trying to do R&D, because, you know, I'm not going to claim I'm the best. I know the cuisine. So we had to do R&D when we were trying to put together a new lunch menu, which has a little more Mexican theme. And that was a fun times. When... You went to Tulum. Who did you go down there with? What chefs? I went with Aron Obregón. I went with Hannes. I went with Letty. I went with Carla Navarro and Franz from Chef's Roll. And did you uh, visit with uh, local chef uh, Drew Bent? Yeah, I did. I saw him working. Yeah. I saw him working. Andrew was there. I saw Philip Esteban was there. Um, and then a couple more. I saw um, the people from Cutwater Spirits. So the the week that we went there was the, the week that like a lot of San Diegans went there to check it out. But that was a great experience. It was super expensive, but it was it was definitely a once in a lifetime event because we we were there for almost six days and we probably ate at between five to seven 
places every day. What did you learn about your time in Tulum? Um, ingredients. Yeah. Ingredients, ingredients, ingredients. I think, you know, a lot of people didn't know that um, Rene r e z e b i has been going to that area, Yucatan, Tulum area for like the last 20 years. So he didn't just like go to Tulum and decided to do a pop-up there. He's been going there forever and he knows the ingredients. He knows a lot of people there. And, you know, a lot of people, there was like, not more so like, Some people like it, some people don't. It's all about like understanding what he was trying to do over there. And he, what he was trying to do is highlight ingredients and doing the techniques that they know would work with those ingredients. He wasn't pretending he was going to do Mexican food. He said he was going to use Mexican ingredients and prepare it the way that they want to prepare it. So there was a lot of dishes that was really mind-blowing. And there was dishes where like, I get it. It wasn't the best dish, but it was, I get it. You know, there was one dish where... I think the fan favorite for a lot of people that went there was the banana ceviche. And then it was like banana ceviche, ants, and like chili oil. It was super simple. But it was like when you ate it, you were like mind blown. All the vegans in the audience are kind of uh, tripping out. Yeah. <laughs> off ants. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot. You know, he had a dish where it's just forged flowers. And you're like, okay. It was just literally like 15 different flowers. And you paired it with like a lime granita. And that was awesome. We were talking earlier um, off, off, uh, off mic about how this is your fifth podcast that you've done. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the worst question you've been asked? I don't know. The worst this one. Question. <laughs> this one. Asking me what the worst. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think I remember a worst question. It was just, you know, um, no matter like how many podcasts you do, people, some of the people who's listening or who will listen to this probably don't know who I am, you know, and trying to learn more about, you know, the chef that they follow or the chef that they saw, you know, on this, you know, featured thing somewhere on the internet. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just getting to know people and spreading the word about whatever project you're doing and what you think. I think for me, cooking is, cooking is a philosophy. You know, it, it doesn't have to do with anything else but a philosophy. If you believe in Something you believe in sustainability, that's cooking. You know, if, if you believe in seasonality, that's for me, it's cooking. You know, so it doesn't have to do with, you know, anything else but philosophy. And that's what I learned from one of, you know, the stages I did was, you know, me and the chef sat down and he was just like explaining to me his, you know, thought process of running a restaurant. You know, he's, you know he does, it's not like sports and X and O's and stuff like that. It's not about training manuals. It's not about, you know, following cookbook recipes, nothing to do with that. It's just philosophy. If you believe in running your kitchen a certain way, and for you, you think that's efficient and effective or whatever it is, if the people that you hire thinks that that's what they believe in too, and, you know, like that's right off the bat, you know, it's, it's what you believe in, it's what you share. And, you know, even home cooks, you know, if they believe that certain things are the way that it should be, then that's what it is. It's just philosophy. In six years that you've been here, you've worked with probably hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. Who have you mentored and where are they now? Um, my, probably my greatest thing that I would take from like San Diego is my time at Whisk and Ladle where I had only six line cooks. And I think three of them are now executive chefs and three of them are like either sous chef or chef de cuisine. Um, and that's, that's a great feeling. You know, you may not be the only reason that they're on that level now, but at least part of it, you know, because you manage them for like a little over a year. You know, I know there's some cooks that almost gave up on cooking entirely. And then you just talk to them and, you know, get to know them and figure out what they want. You know, it's, it's a compromise. Working in the kitchen is nothing but compromise because so many characters and so many personalities in the kitchen. And sometimes it's hard to work with certain people. Sometimes it's just peeling them like onions. Same with me, you know, I've been cooking forever. You know, like I said, I was born into a business and I still have a lot of growing to do and I still learn from other people and I will never claim I'm perfect and I'll never claim that, you know, I'm the nicest guy in the kitchen. But sometimes I believe in, in being firm and being, you know, being strict. And sometimes people will take it. Some people will follow you at the end of the world. You know, I have cooks until now, like this is probably like my fifth or sixth kitchen in San Diego I still have some of my cooks from the very first kitchen still applying to be my cook at the new spot, you know? And sometimes you rub off the wrong way and sometimes they know where you're coming from and you're just trying to teach them. And, you know, it's, it's life. 
you know, it's evolution. So of your uh, protégés or the people you have mentored uh, in your six years here, where should our listeners eat and what uh, what dishes should they get at your protégés restaurants? Um, I think Andrew Reyes at Title is doing great things with um, Island Cuisine. Uh, he's Filipino and he grew up in Guam and he's delivering really, really good. You know, we set the the scene together. You know, he was my chef de cuisine when I was at Title and we were doing Filipino food and it was so easy to kind of move into the island cuisine after that. And he's doing awesome stuff. Um, Sean Brining, um, he's a sous chef there at Title with Andrew Reyes. He followed me from Jersey all the way here. Um, Joanne from Prep Kitchen Little Italy is doing awesome things. Jordan at Prep Kitchen Del Mar. Dusty, who's the executive chef at Catania. So a lot of those people are like doing great things. In San Diego, we, some of our best chefs are Filipino, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, let's let's shout out because it's uh, October and October is Filipino American Month. Mm-hmm. We have Philip Esteban, who's yep. kind of the R and D chef over at the Consortium Holdings. We have Evan Cruz at Artera. We have Cristiana Sabala over at Nomad. Um, Craig Jimenez. Craig Jimenez. Yeah. I mean, Tara from um, Tender Greens. Yeah. One thing that people don't realize is how important Craig is to the whole dining scene. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, he he's started, OG. Yeah. He started, Craig is OG, man. He started over at the Guild with um, uh, Paul Basil. And Paul Basil, um, he was the under Melissa Mayer, who um, was over at um, the Guild. But those guys kind of exploded. Craig took over uh, the neighborhood. Craft and Commerce. Co- and then went mm-hmm. over to Craft and Commerce. So you could say that he helped start CH, I mean, Consortium Holdings, mm-hmm. right? Um, why are we not getting as much love? Or w- how do we get more Filipinos in the kitchens and on people's radars in, in town, you know? What do we do as Filipinos to support these guys? Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly what I did when I went to Anthony Sensei's dinner. You know, it's supporting, supporting with your dollars. You know, it's, you know, we're all living in, you know, a lot of at least cooks, you know, living in a cook's wage, you know, and some are fortunate than others. But this is something I learned from uh, Luke up in Cyclops Farm. Um, I did a dinner with uh, Miguel Valdez uh, for the Red Door, and it was uh, one of those farm-to-table dinners. And Luke had the chance to talk to the diners, and he said it's awesome to be featured in magazine and, you know, to be tagged on every Instagram post, but... Supporting with your dollars, you know, but same thing with Filipino chefs. If you know there's Filipino chefs out there cooking their hearts out, go out there and eat at their restaurant, you know. I'm going to shout out some more Filipinos here. We have Mike Garquinez over at uh, the Lab Dining and Mostra Coffee. We have Johnny Bautista over at uh, George's. Um, We have now gone to Sacramento and a big loss was Derek Alonoso who did Abnormal. So Filipinos more than... You know, people don't realize the the influence and how much we have helped grow this uh, culture and this industry in San Diego. And I just wanted to shout out to all, you know, all these guys that are grinding out there. And, you know, thank you for bringing Filipinos to the forefront. Definitely. I mean, I've, I've learned from them and I've always, you know, every time they call and they're like, want to do a collab, I'm like, yes, you know, no doubt, you know, and... Same thing, you know, when, when we open Bivouac, we're always going to be closed Mondays. And we're closing Mondays because we're going to focus on pop-ups and special events. And we have a lot of great ideas. One of the things that I wanted to do is called Spotlight. And it's collaborating with cooks and sous chefs and chef de cuisines that hasn't done collaboration dinners yet. And I know that one of the things that I was thinking is making sure that I sponsor their food. Because that's one of the things that, you know, when you invite a chef, it's like, are you going to pay for my food costs or I'm going to bring my own food. And, you know, that was one of my ideas is putting line cooks and sous chefs on the spotlight. That's why I'm calling it Spotlight Supper Club. And When do you suppose you're going to launch this? Uh, probably like give us like a couple months after we open. Um, but we're definitely going to close Mondays. We have a lot of ideas to, to do for different um, events. But that's one of the things that I really want to do is when we do those spotlights dinners that – I'm focusing on line cooks and sous chefs and giving them a chance to for the spotlight, you know, because sometimes 
it becomes redundant when it's like the same chefs over and over and you're like trying to support other things and you're like, I just went to your dinner last week and it's like, can't go to the next one. So that's one of the ideas I have because when I was a line cook and I see all these big chefs collaborating, I was like, man, I wish I can be there, you know? And some of them are, you know, super talented that just needs time to shine. You know, they just need a platform to do their food and hope, hopefully, you know, um, we get to get to know all these up and comers. When your last two jobs, or sorry, your, you know, mm-hmm. decoy and now bivouac, mm-hmm. it's, they have something in common that they were from the ground up, but one had a lot of financial backing yeah. and the other one is kind of bootstrap. Yeah. Tell us about that. I think it's just, it probably not has to do with like financial. It's just the, the idea and the, um, the proper research. I think, like I said, like decoy, great. It was not a lot of people talk about it. It's probably wor- cost, costed more than born and raised to put up decoy, you know? Um, because that was a big news when they did that article and it says like 6.5 mil to open up Born and Race. I think ours was like way more than that, but I didn't know, but I know like when you go there and look at it, like it's like a stunning restaurant. It looks great. It's sitting by the water um, and just not enough research. I think like when they thought that fine dining would work up in San Marcos to attract rich people around the area and they're rich for a reason. They're not going to go out and eat three to four times a week. You know, that we should have is it still open? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, who's, I haven't been there in a while. Do you know who's cooking there? No. I don't know. No. Um, but I have a couple of cooks from Decoy that's going to be joining me at Bivouac. Um, it's just so far, like I said, like their market is not ready for that type of, you know, um, not cuisine, but like whatever they're doing out there, whatever their idea was, it just wasn't time. Um, but Bivouac, I mean, cider, untapped market, you know, little Filipino influence, upscale tavern food, great location. People, it's easily accessible to everyone in San Diego. We like, you know, when you're going to a night out with a baby, you know, with a babysitter at your house, you're not going to go up to San Marcos and drive an hour plus and then come back down, you know? Right. So I think location definitely has something to do with it and just the main concept, you know? It was, a, it was a great concept to start, but then once you realize that no one is coming, that's going to be... That puts pressure on everyone else and pressure sometimes can make or break everybody. Totally. How do you, how are you going to approach cider dinners? You know how we have beer dinners. Yes. How are you going to approach cider dinners? Well, I mean, it's just knowledge of the product. You know, like when, when we were developing the menu, you're like, all right, you're scratching your head because you're like, okay, what pairs well with cider? Because it's an untapped, you know, market. And you're like, no one has done cider dinners. And once you learn like, okay, it's kind of built like wine and it's kind of built like beer. And then the idea starts flowing because you know the background of the cider and you know what the flavor profile. So the more cider we taste, I think the easier it is to do the flavor combination. You know, when you just think about apples, there's a million things that can go well with apples. And then you hit it with one of the most common ingredients, which is pork. You know, apple pork, you're, you can throw 10 I'm dinners done. out of apple pork. You know <laughs> what I mean? And then... Next thing you know, like, oh, apple is gluten-free. You're like, dude, gluten-free dinners, done. When you attract gluten-free people, oh, vegetarian, only vegan-based dinners. And then you're, you're on the right track, you know. So right now when, we, um, when I looked over um, the menu that we're ready to launch, it's about 75% gluten-free, the menu, and 50% vegan-vegetarian. When you... Uh our producer over there, Danielle, is like uh, pricking up her ears because like she's that? a vegan. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are the challenges of uh, introducing cider to this community and then bringing your food along with it? What comes first, people liking the cider or people liking your food? I think the cider is the biggest thing because it's, it's the brand that we're building. You know, it's people can get food everywhere else. There's so many great restaurants in San Diego. But – Cider is what we're hoping going to draw the people in. And when they pair it with food, it's understanding how well cider pairs with food, I think, is the biggest thing. You know, a lot of people, like, they make wines because it's a great beverage to go with food, you know. And that's the the boom of, you know, beer. It's because, like, all these beer dinners and people are collaborating. And, you know, San Diego has, you know, great beer scene. Same thing with cider. I think if people learn how to pair well with cider with the food and that's what we're hoping that we're going to achieve is when they 
eat our food with the cider that we're doing is what's going to make them keep coming back for more. Let's let's look forward. Yeah. Um, this takes off. Mm-hmm. And you're, you know, growing this thing and your next step. What do you want to do next? Well, we definitely, you know, for us, like with this, you know, branding in mind, you know. Personally. Personally, yeah. I mean, second location would be great. I mean, I have had the taste of running multiple properties when I was the corporate chef of um, Eat, Drink, and Sleep. And that's for me is like the next challenge is like, it's great that you can run a restaurant. Now try running nine, you know, or just more than one, you know. And the ultimate goal, you know, obviously for a lot of chefs is running their own thing, no matter how big or small it is. But reality is it takes so much money to open up your own thing. And even if you think it's small, it's still, it's going to pile up. It's still $500,000. You know? <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Like no matter, it's, it comes down to financials. If someone's listening out there and want to throw 500 k at me, dude, I'll open you a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like down, down the road, you know, I think like for me, it's still going back to the roots of if I can run a little 20 seater Filipino influenced food, you know, I'd love to do that, you know, here or back in Jersey. Um, could be in the Philippines, you know, could be in the Philippines. I think to be able to run, you know, I was talking to um, a chef friend of mine who's really thinking about going back to the Philippines and giving him advice because he's very young and he's willing to take the risk of going there. He's born, he was born in San Diego. I mean, uh, in Jersey, and he really he's embracing uh, Filipino cuisine. He's is Filipino born in Jersey, and you know, like to be able to run. Think about it. It's just like you know, daydreaming of running San Pellegrino, best restaurant in the world, which is Philippine a Philippine restaurant in Philippines. I think that's like ultimate dream come true. Yeah, I mean, and plus there is, I mean, there's abject poverty in the Philippines, mm-hmm. but at the same time, there's. A lot of rich yeah. people in the Philippines, oh, yeah. like oh, Ma- yeah. Makati, is oh, yeah. an incredibly For rich. Sure. Plus, I was born and raised in the Philippines, so I think deep inside, someday, somehow, even if I'm like fifty or sixty, like to go back home, if I can go back and forth, like that's still going to be like an ultimate goal, you know. Let's talk about uh, your article in Pacific Magazine. Yeah. Talk about that. You're um, dressed up as a character in uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, Game of Thrones. Yeah. And- I mean, we were playing. So when I was talking to the photographer, he was like, I mean, they already know what the article was going to be about. It was It's Chain of Gourmand. It's their, you know, once a year uh, food um, related articles in Pacific Magazine. He was like, I can take a simple chef portfolio or let's do something else. Let's have fun. Yeah. Let's have fun with it. And because of schedule wise, I wasn't the first one who takes picture and it was like Anthony Sensei and he came up with the idea and it's so hilarious. And I was like, oh, I got to one up this guy. <laughs> who is he? Anthony Sensei. No, no. I mean, did, did he dress up as? Oh, no. Who... Like, I mean, he did um, like American Beauty. Okay. Kind of inspired um, thing. And with, then I with saw. With the roses? With vegetables. Oh, with vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so it was hilarious. And then. I saw Davins, I saw um, Andrew Bacalier from Campfire, and I saw Brad Weiss's picture. And then I ended up like being the first on the chain and then being the last one to get photographed because of schedule wise. And I was like, okay. So I went back with the team and they were like, oh, we're going to do something with apples. I'm like, for sure. But like, what should we do? And they're like, oh, Johnny Appleseed, like the story. I was like, I don't even know what the story of Johnny Appleseed is. A Filipino. Yeah. I, was like, I don't know American <laughs> yeah. folklore. But I was like, I love Game of Thrones though. Like, I watched that religiously. And we were like, Let's. How do we kind of tie that into app, apples? And we we're like, "Ooh, cider is coming!" It was like cider is coming, and then we started playing with the ideas of dressing up like Game of Thrones and having the apple there, as you know. And my owner has a snake, or she has a snake at her house, and we did a photo shoot at her dungeon. <laughs> she has a basement; we call it the dungeon, and it just the photos came out super cool, like yeah, I saw super that. animated, and and I prepared the dish that I had there, um, which actually um, won as a runner up for Chef's Roll plating competition which is like the honey um inspired dish so i did a honey inspired dish for the chef's role and i ended up showcasing that for the um, photo shoot so it's a win-win man you just mentioned one of my favorite people that i just recently met brad wise over at trust and hundred proof yeah how how well do you know brad so brad and i brad is from jersey yeah exactly he's from came in new jersey where i spent like seven years and he went to the same school as I did in Jersey, and he worked at Jordan as a sous chef, and he worked as corporate chef of Eat, Drink, and Sleep. So we had a lot yeah. of things to kind of in common, and 
you know, ever since he launched Trust, man, he's just, he's taking, you know, he's probably one of the, you know, be between him and Davin White is like, you know, the forefront of like pushing, you know, um, San Diego to the culinary world, you know, and, you know, seeing his food all the time, it's what pushes me. Seeing everybody's food is what's, it's, it's what, it, you know, every chef does. You see other people's stuff and you push yourself to make a better one. It's just, it's helping everybody like competition and, you know, is also inspiration. Um, I love Wrench and Road and I've been there just a few times because it is pretty far up. Yeah. Um, but I've never actually eaten anything off that menu. No, me too. You know, um, it's one of the few places where I unconditionally trust what that man is going to put on my plate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, between him and got to give a shout out to Willie. Every every event that Darren's doing, you'll see Willie's there. Um, a lot of people still hasn't Hold given on. him. Hold on. One thought. Have you tried his penang curry? No. Not Next yet. time you're at 608, try that penang curry. I've never had, I've never eaten at 608, but I've had his food at a lot of events. Yeah. Every time we and him does an event together, like I always taste his food. And um, obviously campfires up there and um, a newcomer called Dija Mara. I just saw we that. We ate there when we were up north doing like a staycation at Carlsbad. And dude, Balinesian food, come mm. on. Like that's that's awesome to see like another one, like another restaurant that's doing their thing up there. It's It's going to be awesome. So I feel bad now because I've eaten at DJ Mara and not at 608. Sorry, <laughs> Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Willie's, um, I recently was there like less than a month ago. And, okay. Um, it was my first time. And I think Willie is just, him and Dave and you, so many things that people throw away. Yeah. And um, it's, it's truly sustainable. Like they're trying to push that sustainability, not just as yeah. a catchphrase, yeah. but as, you know, when you're eating banana peel and yeah. you're, you know, eating these things like carrot tops that they've uh, pickled mm -hmm. and everything that you see is being utilized in so many different ways and creative ways. I don't know how these guys are, you know, why they're not here in San Diego because ultimately Oceanside is yeah. like so far. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's $45 and an Uber, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, dude, I wouldn't be. I mean, it could be it could be a great thing, you know, like I've seen like I've watched San Diego and, you know, it's always being ignored when it comes to like James Beard nomination and stuff like that. I think I think it's we'll be doing in the, in a few years. I think with those all those people, I mean, like I said, like Brad Wise, Damon, you know, Willie and everybody else that's like doing their thing, you know. I think it's Sooner or later, I think we'll we'll get that recognition. Um, I have a friend that I cooked with at Ten Arts at the Ritz Carlton. Um, he moved to Washington D.C. and he's one of my groomsmen. He was like 26 years old and he got his first Michelin star in Washington. And Washington never had those kind of ratings before. Washington State or DC? D.C. Okay, D.C. You know, so and D.C.'s food has been up there for a very long time, and it took them a long time to get recognized. And I think like if we may not happen during our prime here in San Diego, but like the next generation. So I think educating young cooks and giving them a chance and giving them platforms to keep pushing forward. I think that's what ultimately our jobs is like the chefs that are now being highlighted. And if our job is to keep pushing young cooks and get them to the point where they're better than us, I think that's when we're going to get those recognition in a national level. What is the time frame for that? You say it's not in our... Maybe I'm saying it may not be, you know, but I think like with the noise that we just got to make it louder, you know, what, whatever we're doing, maybe it's not loud enough for the rest of the nation to kind of catch up with. Cause you'll see like people would do like rankings of like best food town and we're not, I don't think we're, we're even like 18. Exactly. You know what I mean? But 18 is better than, you know, 20, better than top 30. But if we keep making noises, like keep building restaurants that are focused on the good things and not just money making restaurants. I mean, obviously you need. You need a balance. Otherwise, the restaurant will close without proper financial management. Um, I think, we'll, you know, it's just timing. Can I just say that uh, one of the reasons where San Diego gets a lot of uh, flack is that we're a copycat city. I think part of the reason why San Diego doesn't get a lot of love is um, for the longest time, we weren't supporting original ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't supporting... Um, you know, a guy like David or a guy like Brad, uh, 
10 years ago, there's a, not even 10 years ago, but like Nick Brune, who's a real good friend of mine, he does eco caters now, but he had a place called um, Local Habit. Like these guys were pushing things and they never, you know, their originality was never um, super supported in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And when you talked earlier about how San Diego needs to focus on, you know, voting with their dollars, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, local habits closed now, you mm-hmm. know, but that was something that is to- was totally unique. Cali Creole, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and um, Nick Brune is one of the most inventive and chaotic in the kitchen, and he's <laughs> you know like because all this wisdom and technique and. Uh, processes in his head and sometimes that doesn't translate well when you're trying to direct people exactly um but you know kind of a tangent let's um yeah well i mean like there's another one that i felt like i don't know if it's ahead of its time or it's just it just didn't work was like ocean pacific grill you know for me like when i ate there and i was like this is cool like someone's doing like 100 percent filipino you know and it closed down and i was like and it was kind of that's you know. kind of a jinx location, though. So that was a place yeah. uh, that it was a caviar champagne bar before yes, that. Yes, I remember when and, it was that. Yeah, and then it became Ocean Pacific. Yeah, and I used to actually live across the street, and that was a yeah. place called like L.A. Rack for ten years. Okay, and all of a sudden it became a, a restaurant. And yeah, all my neighbors were like, "Oh, what the? You know, what, yeah, what's going to go on in there?" And yeah, you know, some of these ideas might have been before their time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like. Like Ocean Pacific Grill was doing this, you know, their modern take on Filipino, and it wasn't until like, like last year when everyone's saying like, oh, it's, you know, it's Philippine cuisine thing. is the next big thing, you know, like if all those people, you know, said that while Ocean Pacific Grill was open, it could have been, it could have made a difference. It could have been the thing, exactly. not the next big Cause thing. Because it was one of the first ones, you know, and they're probably the only one that did modern Filipino food like on that level, you know, and I when I was looking at his menu, I went there for like adobo throwdown or something. And he had a dinugo and ravioli. And I was like, dude, that's genius. You know, like, because people like, who knows dinugo and it's like chocolate milk. And like presenting that to people, people might be like a little off put, you know. And he put it in a ravioli. And I was like, that's really genius. You kind of hide it, but not really hide it. Like, so like for me, like, that's what I'm saying. I felt bad when it closed because I wanted it to be. The thing. I think we all did as Filipinos. Yeah. Um, we wanted to see a restaurant like that succeed because mm-hmm. um, it says a lot about our own culture and our, exactly. own, f- our own food yeah. and where we can take it. And, you know, I see I see these things. I see like, you know, like I think the first time I ever ate at um, Craft and Commerce, um, there were familiar things that Craig was using, that, yeah. you know, whether it was... Um, you know, banana sauce mm-hmm. or things like this, mm-hmm. um, banana ketchup in yeah. his uh, in, in some of his dishes, yeah. and it was it was great to see like it's starting to bubble up even back in two thousand seven or something, mm-hmm. you know, and ten years later, here we are, yeah, talking two Filipino dudes exactly. talking about Filipino cuisine, exactly. Um, so we have come a long way, but there's so much more to go, yeah, and this kind of mirrors both Filipino food. But also San Diego, like 10 years ago, there was um, starting a movement of food. And here we are, fast forward 10 years, and, you know, there are some good restaurants that are getting national publicity. Um, Some of our chefs are winning contests and, you know, uh, awards. But at some point, the potential has to be where, as a city, we step away or we step up from being the potentially next next great city to being a great exactly. city. And, you know, we're sitting here at uh, Specialty Produce recording in their studio, and it's places like this that are putting San Diego on the map, Catalina Offshore, Pacific yeah. Shellfish, you know, uh, Dockside. Our purveyors are so important yes, to definitely. where our, our growth as a city is because we have so many great farms organic farms we have so many great you know fishermen out here and i hope that people start realizing that part of the thing that makes san diego special is the product and then also passing that product off to people who respect yeah the product definitely the ingredients yeah i mean like shout out to all those places they're 
you know, without them, like we wouldn't have a platform, you know, and continually just grinding, you know, it's, it's the grit, you know, there was a, a thing that came out, like, why is Oceanside so different than everything else? And, you know, um, Jessica, um, she said, it's just the grit. And I think the rest just is like a weight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she said, it's just the grit of Oceanside. That's why it's being one of those food, food towns, you know? And I think like that needs to happen. Like in San Diego, everybody should just ha- keep grinding and have that grit. And sometimes they'll have dishes that will work. Sometimes they don't, but you know, there's really no time to just, you know, sit around and do nothing. It's just, let's all keep moving forward, support each other. Um, you know, it's very expensive to support each other, but David and Jessica own the wet noodle in Oceanside, which is a sister restaurants and next door to the ranch and rodent. And, um, ultimately it's probably in my top five restaurants in oh, San yeah, Diego, sure. if, if not top for three. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a combination of, uh, great food and great, um, technique, but more and more than anything, it's like, the affordability of it. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. I know a lot of people think and believe and rightfully so that Ota or Hane um, are, are two of the best sushi restaurants in San Diego. But in my humble opinion, I look at a place like Wrench and Rodent and I'm like, man, this goes beyond sushi. Exactly. You know, way beyond sushi, way beyond farm to table, way beyond, you know, just a restaurant. You know, it's, it's one of those places that are, special in a lot of people's mind because of what they do outside of the restaurant you know being part of he never says no that's why that's his you know good thing and bad thing he never says no like you tell him to help you with an event he's he's there and he's such an awesome person to to be around both of them you know so and i've i'm so honored to be able to have done so many events with them together one of the things that i see more and more my favorite restaurants are owner owned or yeah. chef owned sorry mm-hmm. you know you have like a brad he mm-hmm. owns a, exactly you know is a partner at a trust you have um david you have matt gordon matt gordon i mean i think they're celebrating 10 years this yeah. year whiskey and ladle too it's 10 years yeah so. um so all these restaurants where the chef is the driving force as well as being the financial force of a restaurant at the, you know, Hannes, you mentioned yes. Hannes. I mean, he's another guy. And so how important is it and why is it important to be an owner chef? Well, I think it's, it's meeting. It's like, like you said, like with Devin, Jessica, it's like ownership. And if you're partnering with a chef, it's just, it has to be like almost like a perfect marriage. It's, it's a compromise because a lot of owners, you know, um, are business driven, you know, and a lot of chefs are food driven. And sometimes if they're not matched for each other, you know, it's, it's never going to work because one thing is thinking circle, the other one's thinking square. It's just, it's never going to work. But if you meet those people or group of people that believes of the abilities of the chef and the chefs also needs to compromise, you know, they've in the last six months, I've seen a lot of chef shuffle in San Diego. Some of them are more publicized than other. But, you know, it's sometimes it's on the chef too to compromise, you know, like if, if the owners want something in return of you having some culinary freedom, then, you know, you got to meet them in the middle. You know, it's, it's not a one-sided thing. It's like me and my wife's been together for 12 years, married for six, and I'm not an easy person to get along with. And sometimes she's not an easy person to get along with, but it's, you know, we have a lot of common denominators and it's, it's compromising in the middle. I've seen so many chef and ownership duke it out and sometimes it's not worth it sometimes pride and proving that you're right is the downfall of a lot of great men you know and i've learned that you know in the last six years in san diego and it's it's tough sometimes and but sometimes you just you just have to meet them in the middle and that's where everyone you know should think so on that note where do we follow you what uh social media links uh what uh, what's your address at uh, Bivouac? And uh, tell us more yeah, about so, how we can keep up with yeah, you. Yeah, so Bivouac, uh, p- follow Bivouac Satterworks on Instagram. Uh, I'm DJ underscore Tangalin on Instagram. I usually use Facebook for family things, um, you, but usually food pics and food events I do on Instagram. I keep my Facebook more like family oriented because I have like pictures of my kids in there. And DJ, 
Thank you very much for Thank you. Uh, sitting in. Pleasure to be here. And um, I hope this podcast was uh, not as boring as some of uh, the other ones. <laughs> No, I'm, no, I'm we, just we've done we've done a couple of good ones, so I think people are going to enjoy it and learn more about, you know, not just San Diego food scene, Filipino food scene, and just life in general. I mean, that's what we're trying to do is just you know, if if it's something that's like in your mind, you just speak it out. You know. Thank you, DJ. Thank and, you. Uh, Appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll look forward to your opening. Yeah, soon, but not soon enough. But it's great. All right. Thank you. Cheers, man. If you want to continue the conversation, be sure to check the EDSD group on Facebook and head to PacificSanDiego.com for updates on restaurant openings, new menus, chef profiles, and food forward events. Hey San Diego, I'm Leslie Hackett, Editor-in-Chief at Pacific Magazine. If it's the second Monday of the month, then it's time to celebrate those San Diego restaurants and food businesses that keep your plate full year after year. Those celebrating recent anniversaries include Kettner Exchange, which turned three, The Lot in La Jolla marks four years, and most notably, City Farmers Nursery, which boasts the motto, a little bit of the country in the heart of the city turns 45. Help City Farms celebrate on Sunday, November 19th at Nate's Garden Grill. For more information, visit cityfarmersnursery.com. If you know of a food-related business celebrating an anniversary or other milestone, let us know. Send emails to leslie at pacificsandiego.com. And now, a roundup of food events to watch out for in San Diego between now and the first week of December. Enjoy some of San Diego's finest during the 6th Annual Fish Taco TKO at the San Diego Bay Food and Wine Festival on Tuesday, November 14th at the Broadway Pier. Tickets and information at sandiegowineclassic.com. Sit down with Pacific featured chef Steve Brown, the self-dubbed King of Wagyu in San Diego, as he and his team prepare a multi-course dinner on Friday, November 17th at Olivewood Gardens and Learning Center in Chula Vista. Tickets and information at San Diego Wine Classic.com. Do gooder alert! Cafe Gratitude is hosting its second annual free community Thanksgiving organic plant based meal on Thursday, November 23rd. Give back by volunteering by yourself or with family and friends to help prepare and serve the meal or help fund the event by purchasing one of the Little Italy restaurant's raw, organic, plant based Thanksgiving pies. Pumpkin, pecan, and chocolate coconut cream are all available for $35. Head south of the border for a celebrity chef prepared Thanksgiving meal from Javier Placencia. Club Tango Ombre, the roving supper club, takes guests to Finco Altozano in Valle de Guadalupe on Saturday, November 25th for this unique dining adventure. Transportation from the U.S. side of the border is available. Tickets and information at clubtangoombre.com. Island Food and Beer Fest at Waterfront Park takes place on Saturday, December 2nd. Tickets are $50 plus fees and are available at eventbrite.com. If there's a food event worth filling San Diegans' calendars, let me know. Drop an email to leslie at pacificsandiego.com. And be sure to check out pacificsandiego.com online for more cool events to keep you busy all year long. Thank you for listening to Dish It Up, a collaboration between Pacific Magazine and Facebook group Eating and Drinking San Diego. Craving more? Be sure to sign up for this podcast and our Drink Forward podcast, Kiss My Glass, which hits airwaves on the fourth Monday of the month.